And then uh, let me go bring up the QuickBooks Online test drive. QBO test drive. And then I feel like I have like a million browser windows open because I probably do have a million browser windows open. I've got that one. And then I've got this one. That's the one I was looking for. We can close that and that and that and merge that. Okay. Okay, so hopefully all of you by now have caught either live or on recording the prior sessions I did on the balance sheet and the profit and loss. Not that it's absolutely critical, but it will definitely help provide context for what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and if you haven't been on the site since I kind of redesigned it again during the holidays, Here's where you go to find the stuff. So if you're logged in, you'll see your course locker here. Now, most of you, if you hadn't already had it by the time you signed up for this webinar, I believe I have the website set up to sort of auto sign you up for Nerd Buzz. And that's partly so that you'll have access to these recordings. So if you haven't already reached out to me, I'll send you the link so you can just sign up for Nerd Buzz. It's basically like a free course on the website. And if you go to your course locker, of course, I have all of the courses in it. And you can, you're welcome to sign up for all the courses. Um, but I want to get to Nerd Buzz. Come on, guys. So here's Nerd Buzz. You'll find it in your course locker. And you'll find here Bulletproof webinars, Bulletproof bookkeeping webinars and more. And this is where you'll find all the recordings. So the last one we did was what's wrong with this balance sheet, how to improve valuation. And then this was the profit and loss one we did. Why your CFO services might be worthless, right? And all this kind of comes under the heading of why your CFO service services might be worthless. And the, the underlying message really is that if you're doing CFO services, meaning or, or advisory services or strategic guidance as you know, those are the other terms we use for this kind of thing. Um, the data that we're analyzing has to be accurate before we can analyze it properly. Otherwise it is worthless, right? If I don't have a good and accurate balance sheet and PL, if it's not bulletproof, then I can create ratios and analyze them all day long, but they're telling me the wrong story, right? If my assets aren't accurate and my liabilities aren't accurate, then my quick ratios and my current ratios are not going to be accurate. And then if I'm basing things off of those numbers, then whatever I'm trying to do is just inaccurate. So I'd seen a video from somebody else last year who was talking about how to provide CFO services. And he was talking about how to analyze numbers on the balance sheet or on the profit and loss actually. And he was talking about how as a CFO or somebody who's providing that service, you could go out there and try and structure your services around being able to look at a company's PL and, you know, with the right numbers in place, you could say to them, Hey, I think I can increase your, your bottom line by 400,000 a year. And if I can do that, then it's certainly worth paying me 20,000 a year. Right. That was kind of the approach this guy was taking. It was very, much focused on the sales part of things and how you can try and convince companies to hire you to do these services. But I felt what he like glaringly left out of the whole presentation was the fact that, and maybe because he felt it should be obvious, but I think it's not necessarily obvious to a lot of people walking into this for the first time that before you can do any of that stuff, you really need to do a thorough review of the balance sheet and the profit and loss, and then heaven forbid the statement of cash flows, so that you have a clear picture of the whole picture and you can determine, or I should say you can make sure before you go forward with providing those services and promising that you can increase their net income, you know, you wanna make that promise based on accurate and reliable data. So you gotta do the review and the cleanup first. I would say most jobs that you're gonna take on as an accountant or bookkeeper providing these services should start with some kind of a cleanup. Even if the client walked in my door and said, nope, my books are clean, I would say, great, let me confirm that, right? Because a lot of times they say that and I charge them for an hour and I go through their books and we find out they're not as clean as they thought, you know. They think it's clean, but they don't know what they don't know. And I know how by reviewing the balance sheet accounts line by line, we can determine that. Are the bank accounts reconciled? We get to accounts receivable. Let's look at an aging report. This is, that's usually where the first trouble starts is I'll run the AR aging and they'll see there's balances in there from customers that they know are current with their payments, you know, and so then we commence to start cleaning up the books. 
Um, and it's a great way to convince the client without sort of trying to BS them that they actually need your help. And that's when the client really sees the value. If you did the analysis on your own and the client had, didn't have a look at it, and then you just went back to them and said, yeah, your receivables are a mess. First of all, you wouldn't know that. You wouldn't necessarily know that the receivables should have been marked as paid by now. Secondly, even if you did, there, there's going to be some amount of um, question on their part because they weren't there with you during the process. So this is why I always stress that you do these kinds of analyses with the client together. I had the, the call I referenced that I did earlier today. That was the first thing I said to me is, you know, would it be easier for you to just do this on your own? I said, yeah, it would be a lot easier for me to do this on my own, but then you wouldn't have a clue of what I went through and what I uncovered. And there'd be questions I'd have that having you here will help us get to the answers very quickly. So um, that's really where all this is coming from is your quote unquote CFO services are going to be completely worthless unless you know how to do and then have done the kinds of reviews that we're looking at in these last few videos. So at some point, make sure you go back through the prior videos here on the website. I'm always available. If anybody has questions, you know, just reach out to me. So let's start off by running all three reports. Okay, we're gonna start with a balance sheet and then I'll duplicate my tab. And my profit and loss. All right, and then since this is a sample file and I know there's not really a whole lot of activity, I'm just gonna run it for all dates. Actually, I take that back. There's a reason and I'll explain later why. I, don't, I actually don't wanna do that, but let's see what this year to date looks like on the profit and loss. Because I think what they do is they just kind of consistently update it for the <coughs> prior like 18 months or something. So let's do last year. This is kind of the perfect time of year to be looking at last year anyway. Okay, and then we'll run the statement of cash flows. When you're looking at the statement of cash flows, you really need to be looking at all three reports at the same time. And we'll run this one for last year. Okay, the other thing that's really critically important, if you're taking notes, put this right at the top of your page. If we're doing this analysis, if we're looking at the statement of cash flows especially, notice there's no radio buttons to, to decide if you're running the statement of cash flows on either cash or accrual. Because by the very nature of the report, the statement of cash flows has to be looking at things on an accrual basis. It really doesn't work at all on a cash basis. And I'll explain why. There's two different formats for the statement of cash flows. There's what's called the direct method and the indirect method. The version we're looking at here, the version we always want to be looking at is actually the indirect method. Because what the indirect method does is it starts here, as you can see, with the net income. And skipping way past everything, what it does here is it reconciles that with how much cash you have left at the end of the period that you're looking at right? So the whole very purpose of its existence is to reconcile accrual basis net income to cash, right? So you can't do that on a cash basis. Got to be accrual, right? And so you'll notice my net income for last year, 1696.45. Let's go to the PL, right? 1696.45. So this is always, after you've run the reports, this is the first thing you want to do. Verify the numbers. Make sure that you've got everything kind of lined up with the right and consistent date range before you go on. Otherwise, you'll go in and find that out later that you've got the wrong numbers and you'll find that you've wasted your time, right? Now, we're going to look at, and this is going to be, again, if you're taking notes, this is going to be important. So I look at my total bank balance at the end of the year. It should match the ending cash per, you know, the statement of cash flows. Watch what happens. So it doesn't. 49.63.52. Survey says 2901. I'm going to explain where this is coming from. Let's open up a new spreadsheet, sheets.new. Okay, a cash. Let's just be really clear and specific. Ending cash per statement of cash flows, 4963.52. Okay. Cash balance per balance sheet. Okay, we're gonna skip a line here. <clears throat> and what you're gonna find out, I think is really interesting actually, because it helps explain something that you otherwise might not have had a good way in the past to explain to your business owner clients, right? 
let's actually move this out here. So the ending cash per the balance sheet is 2901, okay? 2901. And I'm just gonna make the space over here to add up whatever I put out here. And just bear with me, you'll see where I'm going with all this, okay? The difference, take that minus that, 2062.52, okay? So a question, do you want me to spoil it for you and put the answer down here? Do you want me to switch over to the balance sheet and let you guys take a look and see if you can figure out what the difference is? And if you already know, be quiet. Take us over to the balance sheet, let us guess. All right, let's see who can figure out what my difference is. Say it out loud. I think I heard it. Who said that? I, I, I did, Lisa. It's undeposited funds. Yep. That's exactly what it is. Undeposited funds. 20, 62, 52. And that accounts for our entire difference. Why? Because undeposited funds is the same thing as cash, right? It is considered, we've been having a lot of these questions in 97 and up recently about. <clears throat> you know, if I wrote a check just before the end of the year, if I got a check just before the end of the year, <clears throat> what year does it go in? We talk about constructive receipt. If it's sitting in undeposited funds, it is considered constructively received in most cases, <laughs> right? The difference would be uh, credit cards being processed where the sale might have happened and the payment might have been processed at the end of the year, but the funds didn't hit the account until the following year. And the logic per the rules that we saw was that you don't have um, control over getting those funds into your account any sooner. Therefore, um, it's, you know, it's not considered constructively received. Hang on, uh, Greg, I'm gonna make you a co-host also. I had already made Lisa one. Um, perfect. Uh, and let me put the chat window up here. So if you do have questions as we're going through this, just post them in the chat and of course I'll get to them. Um, okay, perfect. So that's the answer. That's why you have to take undeposited funds plus the bank accounts to match up with the total cash per the statement of cash flows. Notice there's no, otherwise if, if, if undeposited funds wasn't treated that way, it would need to be considered in this part of the asset section under operating activities, you know, whatever its change was. So, and since it's not, that's your other clue. Uh, it took me a while one day, this was back when I was using QuickBooks desktop and I was having this exact problem. I was trying to tie out the balance sheet cash balance with the statement of cash flows cash at the end of the period and I couldn't figure out why and I did exactly what we did here. Eventually I just, I kept going back and forth between statement of cash flows and the balance sheet and then it hit me because I laid it out like this and I could see what the exact difference was and when I looked after a few minutes I realized the exact difference was the same exact amount as undeposited funds. Well that couldn't be a coincidence and sure enough it wasn't, right? And you can always test the theory by just recording the uh, deposit of those undeposited funds into the bank account, you know, backdate it so that it's in the same period as the statement of cash flows that you're looking at. And sure enough, you'll see then that your balance sheet total bank account balance. Well, obviously, if I'm transferring this number from this part of the balance sheet into the bank account, then it's going to agree, no question, right? So that's the first step. When you're running your three reports, right? You run your balance sheet, you run your profit and loss, and then you run your statement of cash flows. I recommend doing it in that order. Um, and then just verify. Verify that the net income on the statement of cash flows ties to the net income on the profit and loss. If it doesn't in this case, it's either because you ran the profit and loss on a cash basis or you ran it for a different period, right? Those are the things to look for. Now, once you've confirmed all that, now we can kind of get to work, right? And so, how do we reconcile net income to cash? Because again, that's the main purpose of the statement of cash flows. This is what it does. So if you look at it line by line, it can be confusing, right? Because I see, all right, accounts receivable here is negative 5281.52. Let's look here. Well, this happens to be 5281.52, right? Why? Because this, this is the first year of the company doing business, right? In the sample file, it starts as of last year. So whatever you see on the balance sheet actually does represent the total change. And I'll show you how you can confirm this is by going into the balance sheet, right? And compare it to the previous year, okay? 
and then show me the, the dollar and percent change. I'll run that. And now if we go to accounts receivable, you'll see that the, the first column is the current year, or which is really last year that we're looking at. The second column is the prior year, which is zero. <coughs> Excuse me. The entire change to accounts receivable during the year was this. Now that doesn't mean that we haven't collected any receivables. It's very possible that we collected some receivables, um, but didn't collect others. So the, if you add up all the amounts that you invoice during the year and subtract all the payments you received, that's the net accounts receivable, which is the 528152, right? What I'm trying to drive at <coughs> is a statement of cash flows is not looking at the balance in these accounts. It's looking at the change to the balance in these accounts. Now, why it's negative on the statement of cash flows is because what this is saying is if my AR went up by 528152 during the year, then what that means is inside of this net income figure, right, which includes all the revenues I've invoiced for, remember, accrual basis, so it has nothing to do with collections, it's everything I've invoiced minus everything I've collected, right, um, is, the, um, is the net amount that's in accounts receivable. But this net income figure, in other words, includes everything I've invoiced and everything that I've recorded as expenses and how that all nets out. So somewhere sitting inside this number, there's $5,281.52 in receivables that I haven't collected yet which means I have to subtract that from net income to arrive at cash, okay? And an easier illustration to look at, so you really understand this, is let's say it's year zero of the business. I just started this year. I invoice 100K, All right? Let's make those look like numbers. So I just invoiced 100K, haven't collected any of it, which means my net income is 100K, right? Assuming I have no expenses, nothing else happened. I just, I wrote an invoice and I'm gonna collect 100K hopefully and didn't have to incur any expenses, right? So all I have on my P&L is $100,000. My balance sheet's empty. I haven't done anything, haven't even deposited any money to start the bank account, right? So the statement of cash flows is gonna say, okay, well, we start out with net income of 100,000, right? But, the change to AR is also 100,000, so I have to subtract that out. Which means the cash at the end of the period is a big fat zero, okay? So that's an easy way to understand the illustration for how the statement of cash flows is analyzing the numbers. What it's saying is, yeah, great, you've made $100,000 of net income, but you haven't collected any of it. So you might be out of business soon, right? And that's kind of the purpose of the statement of cash flows. It, the way I like to put it is that it has a way of removing the BS from the equation. And I don't mean balance sheet, right? Because all the non-cash stuff like depreciation and other things we can do to play games on the balance sheet and P&L, if that's what we're trying to do, they kind of, they effectively get eliminated on the statement of cash flows. The statement of cash flows basically says, yeah, great, you made uh, $1,600, but you also have 5,200 of revenues they haven't collected yet. So you don't have that in cash, okay? Why is inventory negative? Because we buy and sell inventory and a negative amount for inventory or any asset on the statement of cash flows for that matter means that more money went out of the account to pay for that than what came in, right? In other words, more inventory was purchased than what was sold at cost based on $596.25, right? I can click into this number to see. There's a bunch of invoices, right? But then there's also a bunch of checks, you know, and bills to pay for that inventory. So what this means when I see this here, if it's negative, it means money went out of the bank to buy inventory that wasn't included in net income because it's still sitting on the balance sheet as an asset. If I go back to the balance sheet and look at the inventory asset, we started out with no inventory. The change was 596.25, the net change. Now, as you just saw, there's, it's not just one transaction for 596.25. There's a lot of activity in between. We bought inventory and we sold inventory. At the end of the day, we bought more than we sold by 596.25. That's what this is saying. If we sold more inventory than we bought, this would be a positive number because that would mean that the inventory balance during the year went down instead of up.
okay? And the, the, the only way you're going to understand this is really by going through it yourself line by line and making sure that you can explain it the way I'm explaining it today, right? It can be really confusing and tricky to wrap your head around what's going on with the statement of cash flows. I had to give myself a crash course in this one day because I was engaged and I agreed to do some financial projections where they actually wanted a projected statement of cash flows along with the balance sheet and P&L. And I was like, oh crap, I've got to learn this fast. So that's what I did. Okay. So now all these numbers basically are representing amounts that affected the bank account, but weren't included in net income. That's the easiest way to explain what's going on here. So that brings us to accounts payable. What this means is for accounts payable, I might have entered bills, which on an accrual basis is included in expenses, included in net income. But if I have an increase in accounts payable, that means I have more, more that I've added in bills than what I've paid, which means I have expenses included in this number, which I haven't paid for yet. So I have to add that back to net income to arrive at cash, right? An increase to accounts receivable gets subtracted from net income to arrive at cash an increase to accounts payable gets added back to net income to arrive at cash. That's what you're really doing here is you're taking what you started out with in net income and looking at what happened on the balance sheet and backing up from net income to arrive at what's in cash in the bank. Credit cards, any liabilities are gonna work that same way. So if I see a positive number alongside a credit card on the statement of cash flows, what that means is I've charged more on that credit card than what I've paid off during the month in this case, to the tune of 1,373. It means I have expenses on the books that are included in net income that I haven't paid for yet because instead of paying for them, I stuck them on the MasterCard. I increased the liability. So this 1,373 are charges that were included in net income, but that didn't come out of the bank. So I have to add them back to net income to arrive at cash. Okay, it looks like sales tax payable went flat here um, for the state of Arizona. For Board of Equalization, they have to update that. It's not called the Board of Equalization anymore. It's so far behind God. And into it's based in California. What are they thinking? Anyway, so again, these are sales tax payable accounts. So they're liabilities. So, so this means that there's sales tax payable that, um, that, um, that's been accrued, right? So I increase the liability. It's not included in net income, which means I need to add that back to net income to arrive at cash. Right, the sales tax is even a little trickier one because it's really not a function of an expense. It's actually a reduction of what was included in what I invoiced. Again, get the rest of this figured out and get that clear and then we can worry about the more tricky ones like the sales taxes, right? Loan payable, same thing. It means money theoretically came into my account that wasn't included in income because it's not income, right? So if I have an increase to a loan payable, it means I had an increase to cash that's not included in that income, so I have to add that. So I add that back to net income to arrive at cash. Conversely, if I pay off a loan, then of course the, the, the extent to which I've paid off loans in excess of what I've borrowed during a period, we're gonna subtract those out because loan payments are money that went out of the bank account that's not included in net income. We're not talking about interest, we're talking about principal, right? So the principal portion of loan payments are monies that went out of the bank account that weren't included in net income which means they would have to be subtracted from net income to arrive at cash. So when you see a positive number in a loan payable, it means we just borrowed it this year, right? So if we go down here to loan payable, it's actually 25,000 here. Uh, I'm sorry, wrong loan payable, that's the note payable. The loan payable is here for 4,000, right? There was nothing before this year. So the whole amount is money received in cash that, that, hasn't, that doesn't get included in net income. Is it just showing up there? because it's listed as a current liability? Is that why it's showing up in the- I'll show you, yeah, so loan payable, because it's current, it shows up here in operating activities, okay? The note payable notice shows up in financing activities. Long-term is considered financing instead of operating when it comes to loans. Right. Right, so yeah, it's a different classification, but the loan payable, anything current is considered part of operating activities. And you can, if you want to change that mapping, right? If you want to present it differently for some reason, you know, I, I, I wouldn't recommend doing that, but you can, you know, I could see where somebody might want to take this and put it into operating, you know, but usually the idea is long-term financing like this is usually tied into equipment that we bought, which is in the investing activities section, right? 
So we finance the purchase of equipment. Purchasing equipment is an investing activity. Therefore, any loans associated with that is considered financing. Right, that's the breakdown. And we can look in and figure that out. Which brings us to the investing activities, which is the fixed asset part. This is where fixed asset activity essentially goes on the statement of cash flows. It's considered investing activities. When I buy a major piece of equipment for the company, it's considered that I'm making an investment into the company. Usually, as we've discussed in prior sessions, I'm putting money into that equipment because I'm expecting some kind of a return on that equipment or a return on assets, right? I buy equipment because it's gonna help me produce whatever it is that I produced, maybe more efficiently or maybe to be able to produce it at all, right? So there's a return I'm expecting back on that asset, which is why it's considered an investment and not an operating activity. So if it's negative, that means we money went out of the bank. We bought equipment, right? That's not included in net income because I didn't expense it. It went onto the balance sheet as a fixed asset. So this is money that went out of the bank that's not included in net income, which means it needs to be subtracted from net income to arrive at cash, right? It went out of the bank. It wasn't included in net income, so we have to subtract it from net income to arrive at cash. Now, if we click in here, Sure enough, here it is. We did a journal entry. Let's click into the journal entry. Okay. So here we just put the truck on the books. The offset is in the opening balance equity, right? Which also is going to show up on the statement of cash flows, but in a different place. Let's back up. So that's, that's netting out with some other activity here in the opening balance equity account. Right, and we'll dig into that in just a minute. But first we have the notes payable, which once again, it's in financing because it's long-term, okay? And here, same thing. So there's your other part of opening balance equity. We put a note payable on the books for 25,000 and we set it up as, an, as a beginning balance, right? And so that's going into opening balance equity. So if I say, actually, I always do that. I always close the entry and then realize if I back up, it's gonna just take me back to the entry. Yeah. So now if I click into the opening balance equity, remember we are not looking at the balance sheet. Now we are looking at the statement of cash flows. But when I click in here, you'll see there's a bunch of stuff that nets out to the negative 93.37.50. But there is the deposit that we started the checking account with, right? The piece of equipment that we put on the books, the note that we put on the books. Looks like we started off our savings account with some money here. Here's the other, the, the short-term note payable, right? It's all here. Um, it looks like we put some other beginning balances on the books. So all that netted out to a negative 93.37.50 because it all represents money that either came into the bank account or went out of the bank account or didn't, right? So we have to ultimately, we're subtracting this from net income to arrive at cash because this is all stuff that wasn't included on the balance sheet, but that ultimately reflected money that came in or out of the bank account right? Some of this is offset by what's sitting in other places, like the 13495 here is offset by this negative 13495 here, right? So really what the, um, the impact cash flow wise on this, this doesn't have an impact on cash. These do, because this is money that we put into the bank account. This doesn't have an impact on cash because this is offset by a, an increase to a note payable and the liabilities. Same with this, Right, so really to get to the 93.37.50, it's 5,000 plus 600, right? Um, minus 750 minus, oh, oh no, I'm sorry, plus 750 plus 25, so plus all these other things, right? The 4,000 is actually above the line too. Yeah, but the 4,000 isn't included in, it's not impacting cash, it's offset by a liability, right? We're looking in the opening balance equity detail. This is offset by a liability. This is offset by a liability. This is offset by a fixed asset. So if I just quickly dump this to Excel. <laughs> Someday. Someday. Maybe try that again. <coughs> there we go. Okay. 
So I want to eliminate all the things that I know didn't impact cash. And let's, uh, ah, a couple of cleanup things. We'll uh, unmerge and unwrap stuff. Otherwise it has a way of getting in the way. Okay, so this no impact to cash, it was offset by a fixed asset. These no impact to cash, they were offset by liabilities. This should get me, I could be wrong about this, but I believe this should get me. Okay, this is 61, 67, 50. So the reason it goes the other way is because, okay, never mind. I misspoke. Okay, so we get to the negative 93, 37.50. I'm trying to get at the impact on the statement of cash flows here and how we arrive at that, but it is actually the net <coughs> of all the activity in here. But what I really want you to see is the true impact of cash is, or I want you to understand which items do and don't impact cash, right? The deposit into the checking account impacts cash. Deposit into savings does. Um, these guys are, it looks like for inventory, that was contributed. So these technically wouldn't. Okay, but the, so I'm trying to analyze the effect of opening balance equity. We're subtracting this from net income to arrive at cash because net net, it ultimately represents an increase to liabilities that exceeded decreases anywhere else, right? Or that exceeded increases anywhere else. So that we end up with 93.37.50 in net opening balance equity activity, which is hitting the balance sheet, but not hitting but not touching the PL. So again, we subtract this out from net income to arrive at cash. And obviously, if you do the math, you'll see that we take the total, uh, they call it adjustments to reconcile net income to cash uh, provided by operations. Normally, when I prepare a statement of cash flows, I just say net operating activities, 1099.57, right? You add this back to the net income and you get the 279602. <coughs> Then you subtract the total for investing activities because it's negative. And then you add back the uh, cash impact from financing activities. And if you add that all up, obviously it will get you to the 4963.52. So again, I'm not gonna lie, it can be very confusing and tricky. The best way to understand this, the way I figured it out that one day years ago when I was sort of giving myself a crash course was I just kind of bounced back and forth between the balance sheet and the statement of cash flows and I clicked in and tried to understand what was impacting this. Why is accounts receivable negative? Why is accounts payable positive in this case, right? But a real easy way to see very quickly is to actually run the comparative balance sheet for the same exact period and you'll see exactly the change. This column should actually match perfectly Actually, it should be the opposite of what the statement of cash flow says, right? Because here the change Actually, is- Seth, I think that's the key. I think when you're doing, looking at the cash flow, you have to look at, at the change. I think if anybody has a review to report, that's where you see the, the movement and where it starts making sense to you. Yep. But as I was saying, remember that a change here, positive increase to accounts receivable is going to be a negative on the P&L, mm -hmm. on the statement of cash flows. Right. But yeah. That's why I started the whole thing off today by saying, before you do anything, run all three, right? The P&L you're basically done with once you've confirmed that your net income figure ties. There's nothing more you really need to analyze here. It's just, it's literally the exact starting point of your statement of cash flows. So you can almost close this and then really just focus on, because everything else on the statement of cash flows is analyzing changes to balances from the balance sheet. And if you really want to have some fun, what I would suggest you do, take this balance sheet, dump it into Excel, right? And then take your P&L. You don't really have to dump that. Again, you just need that net income number. But then using that information, prepare the statement of cash flows yourself and get it to agree to this one. That's a good way to learn. If you you'd really if, you'd, you'd yeah. have to think about what the movement means. Exactly. So that's kind of your homework and your exercise. And if you can do that, then you've understood this very well. And the process of trying to do that and screwing it up and then figuring out what you did wrong and then fixing it will really drive it home for you. That's literally how I learned it. As I, I had to prepare one <clears throat> to make matters worse, I had to prepare a projected one. 
right? But in order to do that, I had to understand what the historical one was saying and I had to be able to prepare it. But, but yeah, I'm glad I actually thought to say that because that would be the best way to learn this is go into your sample QuickBooks Online test drive, run the balance sheet, P&L and statement of cash flows there. Again, do that initial check, make sure all the numbers that you have are, are lining up right. And then dump the balance sheet and P&L into Excel and prepare your own statement of cash flows and get it to balance. If you can do that, and this one is simple enough. There's not a whole lot of accounts going on, but if you can get that conceptually, then adding to the balance sheet, you know, to the chart of accounts, <clears throat> what you'll start to realize is all assets work the same way and all liabilities work the same way. And equity accounts always work exactly like liabilities accounts. They're just in different sections on the statement of cash flows, right? But basically what you have to do to one liability account to get it to balance on the statement of cash flows is what you would have to do to any liability account to get it to balance on the statement of cash flows. So, so that's your homework assignment from today's webinar. And I'll put that up in the description. I did, Lisa, you had asked me, I think, on this one, if I would make sure that I put the, uh, let me turn my screen sharing back on, to make sure if I put the link to the spreadsheet on here. Oh, yeah. Um, and actually it looks like I didn't. Was it this one that I, there was uh, one of these recently that you said, hey, I know it's super simple, but could you include the spreadsheet? Yeah, that was last week. Yeah, it was. So that was this one. What's wrong with this balance sheet? All right, I, yeah. I, I thought I added it in. It looks like I didn't. So I'll make sure that I do. And I'll do, I'll do something similar with today's. I'll, you know, I know I kind of just scratched this out roughly, <clears throat> but I'll include this for you as well. But I'll also include in the write-up you know, that your homework assignment is to take the QBO test drive company, run the reports and get the statement of cash flows to balance on your own. Because like I said, if, uh, if you can do that, then you, then you own this. That will teach you for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I mean when I say, then you own this, you know, you own the knowledge. It will be yours and you will not likely forget it. Cause I mean, you'll literally have to sweat through this probably trying to figure it out at some point, but once you get to the other side of it, it's like one of those things, there's like, I learned this in another area of my life, that there's really three levels of understanding something, right? There's sort of like a superficial level, like I recognize that I'm familiar with it, but heaven forbid if I had to explain it to somebody else, right? And then there's the next level is where I have a little better understanding. I, I have like reading comprehension, you know, I can read it and I can understand what it's talking about. But at the deepest level, two things can happen. One, I'm never going to forget it. And two, I can teach it to somebody else, right? When you know something well enough to teach it to somebody else, then that means you have the deepest possible level of understanding of it. So that's it. That's your homework. Any questions? Anyone? Bueller? It was fun. But yeah, the statement of cash flows is a lot of fun. I'm sure a lot of people would agree with that statement. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, it, it, it really, I actually just had a client ask me this week. week he's like, where did all my money go? And I was like, well, let me show you your statement of cash flow. <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> and it really, it, it explains it. I mean, it's, it's such a good visual. Um, it explains it perfectly. Yeah, because uh -huh. you can see if, if, if AR is a negative number on the statement of cash flows, it means that's where cash is tied up. It's in uncollected receivables. You can, you can see it all. You can also see if, you know, if your payables went down, then you exhausted cash, you know, and used it up to, set, you know, pay down your payables. The same thing with your credit cards. You can see if those are negative, that means you used up cash paying down, you know, all the liabilities. It does. It explains the answer to that question perfectly, but you still have to be prepared to go through it and explain it to your client because they're going to look at that and say, well, it sounds good, but I don't understand it. And so now you have to go explain it to them. And my favorite is when it becomes apparent that they took a lot of money out in distributions and then they deny having done it. But then even from the statement of cash flows or the balance sheet, you can click right over to that and show them the list of transactions, which again, goes back to what I was saying at the beginning of the hour. If you've got your books bulletproof, which means every transaction is reconciled, then that list of distributions can absolutely be confirmed. And if need be, you can trace it back to the bank statement when it cleared and go get a copy of a check to prove to them that they actually wrote themselves that check, right? Because <laughs> I've had those experiences where I've had to go that far to prove it to them. Otherwise, they're going to think you did your job wrong and you messed up my books. That's, that's exactly what they're going to say. I didn't take that much money out. I know I didn't, right? Well, let me prove it to you. That's why I like the idea of having bulletproof books. That's just a question of getting a client to be willing to pay you enough to pay it that kind of attention. I just had that conversation this morning with Erica because we have a client that we've had for a number of years now who, uh, 
you know, tends to not have a lot of money and he uses Shopify and to, to get the Shopify clearing to reconcile is going to require a lot of attention, which I'm going to put that choice on him. If he wants us to give him that kind of attention, we need to increase the fee um, because we can't, for what we're charging him, I'm not willing to, to make that bulletproof. You know, that's the difference. The cost of bulletproof books is, is high because it takes a lot of attention and that's the way I like to explain it in terms of pricing services, you know, to do this kind of an analysis for a company, especially if they want it on a regular basis, which would actually be a really good idea. You want to provide strategic and advisory services, you know, forget some of the KPI apps. I don't care about any of that. If you can do this for a client, so much more valuable than throwing them some pretty charts and graphs, you know, really explain to them what happened to their money. Where'd my money go? Um, it's funny because I, I was trying to think the other day of like a perfect call to action for uh you know, kind of selling the Bulletproof Bookkeeping course. And my wife gave it to me because I was telling her, I was racking my brain trying to think of things. She's, I was like, I'm, I'm trying to think of a good, like, you know, short, concise question that I can pose to people that can get them to consider, um, you know, whether they need the course. And my wife was like, she just blurted it out because she's heard me say it so many times, but my head was so deep in it, I couldn't think of it. And she's like, where did all my money go? That's the question we're here to answer for people. Right? Greg, where'd all your money go? It's still in the bank. Good for you. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So if there's no more questions, I'm going to run because I'm still feeling under the weather. I'm going to go get out on top. Of, I'm going to go get out and sit on top of a cloud somewhere so I can be over the weather. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. If you so find you're out still about below the, the solar weather. That's true. So I'm like in between the weather somehow. I don't know. Now, now I'm all confused. I'm going to just go back to reading the statement again. I think we're always just in the weather. Yeah, no matter where we go, unless we go so far up that we go like beyond the sun. But I think we're going to have some other problems by then. Right. right. Especially if we don't have a spaceship and a space suit on. <laughs> you too. <laughs> <laughs> how long can you guys carry this on? Probably I'll try to see how long we can hours. carry this on for before all the people drop off the call and say, okay, yeah, I'm out. <laughs> No, because Lisa would not drop off. She'd be like, wow, this is mesmerizing. Yeah, I'd be like, this is amazing what these two guys talk about. The, the, the excuse me, shit that we can away. come up with. See, more people <laughs> yeah. drop it off. They're like, yeah, I'm out. That's funny. Uh, I love yeah, it. And we could, we could take side bets on, on who's going to be uh, – Who's going to still be sticking around? And then I think Melissa would stick around. And I have a feeling Courtney might stick around. Too. I, was say, I think it's, I think it's the 97 the uppers that are staying. Look at that. It's almost 97 I think, uppers. We've got Janice still hanging I think on. Jesse is probably I, not even paying attention. I think Jesse is out hiking. Exactly. I don't think he's here at all. Oh, wait. <laughs> There's Courtney. And Jesse's here. He is there. Look, now I know how to get people to turn their cameras on. <laughs> Uh, Jenna, is she with us? She's one last uh, non 97 and upper here. Yeah, we scared everyone else away. Wait, Jenna's unmuted now. Oh. Are you there, Jenna? Hello. Oh, she's unmuted, but not talking. Yeah, well, she might be having. You know, she's busted. <laughs> I think I can stop the recording now.